things that would bring us together and unite us, those differences, those different regions, those different values, to think of themselves as something greater than an individual province, to think of themselves as, as uh, you know, a unit that can be on the world stage that we can, that we can all benefit from in terms of what we are as a country. And that's how we need to be thinking about it. What would we do today to bring that together, to have everybody want to renew a commitment to this country, to the greatest country, quite frankly, in the world? Let's have that discussion. There's nothing yeah. wrong with nationalism. There's nothing wrong with being proud of the country that we are. How do we, how do we make sure we can move our resources? How do we make sure decisions can be made? How do we make sure that you know we can have free trade across our, prov- our prov- provinces? How do we make sure that we can keep you know, the type of food security and energy security that we need, you know, to be strong, both provincially and, and nationally. Let's have this conversation about it, because I think what we'll, we'll find is at a high level, we have far more in common than the divisions that we're seeing today um, in our country. And so... How do you go about having those discussions? Well, it's like, like I that's say... A, that's a, that's a, seems to be a little bit of a fickle... <laughs> how do you do that? Like, how do you get people to engage and actually... Because the conversation has to result in a little bit of an, uh, a, a better understanding. Whether you agree with a thing or not is irrelevant. But how do you get to people to kind of come together? And a conversation is two ways. So that's engagement. You know, that's yep. people contributing. There's a lot of nuance there, uh, how would you go about trying to achieve that with the goal of actually uniting really is what you're talking about and engaging different people to be able to formulate policy? Well, I think, you know, really at the provincial level, you're working uh, premier to premier, um, you're working, you know, governments to governments and you start off by working on that free trade agreement. What are the things that we can set aside mm. so that we can have open and clear trade between the provinces? That then leads to the discussion of what is what do we need to set as a country? How do we bring this together? What are the values that we need to make sure that are the foundation of Canada? And from there, you engage, of course, with the federal government on that. But each province then has to engage with its people as well and talk about this. And let's, like I say, let's have this conversation. Because there is such a growing lack of confidence in our institutions and in government. I mean, in Ipsos Reid did has done a ton of polling across Canada in terms of what Canadians think. Only 10% of Canadians trust a politician. And so we need to find Mm. how do we, how do we open that up? How do we have the conversation? How do we try to restore that confidence in us as a government and in our institutions? How do we make sure that people, um, you know, can, can see things to see a path that's different. All of that is part of the conversation about how we renew this country. And it's, it's not an easy conversation. I don't anticipate this is going to happen overnight. But it's a conversation that you start and you grow, you try to build momentum for, um, and uh, hopefully uh, you know you can be successful. Because if we can't bring this country together, there is these movements, whether it is you know alienation from the West or whether it's Quebec or whatever the case may be, there's no reason this country needs to be pulled apart like that. We have the potential to be much more than what we are today. Do you see opportunity on the provincial landscape to have those conversations? Maybe Certainly. where it's leak, it's lacking right now. Certainly, and this, you know, people talk about the rural urban divide or the north versus the south, and yeah. you know, back in twenty thirteen, there was a movement on Vancouver Island to separate, and this is all part of the same problem that we have nationally, and so we have to have the same sort of thought as to who we are as a province and how we can function as a province and how we support each other. And how we have this symbiotic relationship, it's not about, you know, one group or another group and and whoever's in power. It's got to be about all of us and how we bring it together. And this is why, quite frankly, I say we need a new party, a new political party in this province. We need to have a party that's actually going to set aside these ridiculous political positioning and, and, you know, elitism approaches to this and just get down to the fundamentals of people and what we need to do as a province. What's your goal? bring about change Thank come you. come the election uh you you've got a goal and and we kind of talked about this i i think i asked this question yesterday too um and i think it's an important one because it gives a sense of direction and when you're talking about people being part of the conversation they're wondering okay how do i get involved what's the goal what are we trying to accomplish so you've taken on you know leadership for an old party 
Um, I'm not sure what that discussion was like with Trevor and all of that, but there must have been, I think, a goal that was discussed to allow you to become leader in such a short period of time. And so what does that look like? What is What are your ambitions? And especially when we're walking into you know, upcoming elections in 2014. 2024. 2024. But, I no, mean. That's okay. now, <laughs> now I got you confused. With yeah, the yeah. Um, you know, so the conversation I had with Trevor, I mean, I, I thank Trevor for the work he'd done, um, you know, in keeping this party alive. And believe me, there's lots of infighting that was going on in the Conservative Party, and he had to guide his, guide his way through that. It was not easy. Um, and uh, But I talked to him about, you know, the work that needs to be done to be able to attract candidates and try to be really be a player on the scene. It's not a matter of just trying to elect a few people and, you know, I'm, I want to elect people in every corner of this province. We want to fight for every riding in this province. You know, the Vancouver Island, for example, the NDP take it for granted and the, and the United Party has written it off. And they're looking, people in Vancouver Island are looking, saying, well, you know, who's really fighting for our values? Who's really fighting for what we need to do? And I, I told people that we are going to fight for the ridings on Vancouver Island and in the by-election in a riding that's a solid NDP riding, we finished second. We actually got 20% of the vote. We had it ahead of the Green Party the and, and the Liberal Party, you know, was kicked down to only 8% of the vote on the island. Was that the, was that the riding Horgan was in? Yes. That's the, the <laughs> Langford one Fuca riding, right? Like, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Well, I mean, we're talking, so Horgan's riding went from NDP and stayed NDP, but it brought Conservative Party up above the party you had left above above all the other parties in the province and you know and so this is a party that had never run a candidate in this riding in its existence has in, in a snap in, of a finger like three, we're talking within three, three months, months we went from not even being on the radar to having 20 percent of the vote in that riding and so you know we're seeing this momentum across the province as people joining the party and people stepping up and interested in, in being a part of who we are did do you think that resonated in the public awareness like that that's a very significant shift and so within that riding obviously that was probably a wake-up call to a lot of people but did that catch the attention beyond the island like his riding oh, no, no question no question people around the province and and we saw an immediate reaction you know both in the media were like 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 holy crap yeah like how did you guys do this what happened right and so they're thinking well it was a fluke or it was confusion with brand or it was you know or just because we had a good candidate or the, they don't because the media can't understand how there can be suddenly a, such a big shift like that in such a short period of time and so uh, however across the province now this is the conversation for anybody that's paying attention to politics this is the conversation where is this going what does this mean you know what does this mean for ridings in the in the peace country what does this mean for ridings in the caribou what does this mean you know for ridings in the lower mainland and, um, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's been very interesting to see the reaction to that. But, you know, we can't assume that that is, that is, you know, the path, the only path we're on. We have to keep fighting. The one thing I get asked time and time again is, how can I trust you? And I mm -hmm. tell people, I say, you know, with only 10% of the population trusting a politician, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I'm not expecting people just to be able to come on right out and say, we trust you. <coughs> what I want to do is I want to demonstrate what we will do, how we will do it, and so that you can look at those results and believe in what we're doing. And that's that's the commitment. That's what we're how what we're trying to do to build the party. And it's, so it's not a matter of I don't want to go out. I'm not going to be spinning something different to the north than I am to the island, to that I am to Victoria, or or I mean to uh, to say Surrey. I'm going to stand for values. I'm going to be saying those same values everywhere I go. I'm going to be talking about how I'm going to achieve those values. And that's what I want people to put some faith in, in terms of how we can change politics and what it will do for people. So are you traveling around British Columbia right now trying to establish all your different writings? And what does that look like right now? Well, it's a, it's a pretty exhausting tour, obviously, um, mm -hmm. in terms of it. I'm trying to get everywhere I can. Uh, there's requests from radium from all sections of the province to be able to come there, even you know from the Sunshine Coast that, once again, has never had a can conservative candidate. There's a group there that are really keen. They want to build uh, and do things. Um, the Kootenays have been asking me numerous times to get down there for meetings, so I'm, I'm hopefully going to be there in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to spend you know time in the Okanagan, of course, uh, in the Caribou. Um, really, I'm going to be traveling right around the province. And it's interesting, I've actually been spending a fair bit of time in places like Surrey 
and uh, and out in the valley in Abbotsford and and uh, I find it really interesting. People say, "Well, you know, you can't win in Surrey." I say, "No, that's not true." The things that we're talking about in Surrey, the things that that we're championing, um, you know, really around the province, are the things that people are talking, the everyday average person is talking about in Surrey. And we are c- trying to connect with them. We are connecting with them. We've got lots of requests from people, uh, even from from the temples or the gurdwaras, uh, you know, right out to um, you know just the average person on the street that want to engage and have a conversation mm-hmm. about these values. It's things like you know pa- giving parents choice. Like what we're doing in our education system is is um, it's completely lost. It's completely become watered down. It needs to be refocused on academics. And we need to be refocused on, you know, showing the progress of kids and, and working, making sure that we're preparing them as best we can for their future. Instead, you know, we've got all of these social issues that are, are tied up in our education system. And, it's, you know, I just look at it and think it's just wrong what we're doing there. Um, a few a few weeks you, ago, and I'll, I'll just want to relate a little story about, about sure. the education system. A few weeks ago, um, um, a friend shared the story with me. And uh, the six-year-old boy came home from school and sitting around the, the dinner table and, and, and leaned over and said, Grandpa, is it okay that I'm a boy? Mm, yeah. And uh. six years old, coming out of school, how on earth is that a conversation that's being created in our education system? Let kids be kids. Yeah. No, you're... Okay, so we're... These are some topics that are very important to talk about because this is, I think, what a lot of people are having conversations about. And I think it's affecting parties and the politics and the whips and a lot of things that are, you know, shaping the landscape, not only politically, but within our own lives. And and we're talking about the education system. We're talking about, uh, you know, <coughs> Aboriginal affairs and treaty. Um, treaty 8 in this area is a big one right now. So I'd like to get into that because that's important. You're touching on, you know, children now coming home and, and there's a lot of questions being raised, especially with our education system, the curriculum that's being taught. We... I'm glad you're willing to talk about it because these are very, very important subjects. It can also be very polarizing. So when people are wanting to know more about your position and what the BC, or sorry, the Conservative of BC, uh, British Columbia represents, what is your answer? Like, what is what is your position on that now? I try to be as straight up as I can. I try with, with people. I mean, you know, I, I, when I say I try to be as straight up as possible, what I mean by that is... Obviously, I want to save uh, some things that we're going to be doing and that we want to put out there for the election. You want to be able to have some surprises and some information, you know, as part of putting together your platform. So you can't reveal everything that you're doing. But I do want to talk about the values that we do stand for. And so when people ask about those questions, whether it's education or whether it's, you know, what's going on with Indigenous population in the province, I want to be as straight up as I can um, about where we are at in terms of our fundamentals and values but also keeping in mind that, you know, some of that I want to keep back just because, you know, we want to be able to have some, some things that are fresh and new and surprising uh, when you get into an election. Fair enough, but there's got to be, I think, uh, an idea on, do you have concerns about the education system? Do yes, you definitely. have concerns about uh, what are being taught in, in our school system as far as curriculum? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and that's why I say, right, I mean, we stand for parents' choice, right? We think mm-hmm. that, you know, families are best suited to address social issues, not our school system, and let our school system be focused on academics. One of the things I would love to do, and I don't know whether, you know, what, what it would take to actually do this, because every government's talked about this for, for decades. Why on earth don't we have just a basic course, a mandatory course, just teaching fundamentals of, um, you know, debt, deficits, you know, credit cards, you know, compound interest, just yeah. the every things that impact, impact everyday lives for people. Um, you know, that should be mandatory information so that people can at least have a sense of what government's doing and, and how it's affecting and, and where all these things are going. We don't see, you know, people coming out of our education system with really a lot of understanding of that side. So on the flip side, we've got all these social issues that are being pushed in our education system, but not the fundamentals of how our society works. Something's wrong with that. There needs to be a shift in terms of how we do 
uh, education. And, and our education system really needs to be focused on teaching kids how to think, not what to think. There's too much about teaching kids what to think, and I, I just think that's that's wrong. It doesn't prepare, prepare our kids for uh, what I believe they're going to be facing when they come out of the system. Yeah, well, there's a lot of concerns, and parents are finding in around SOGI, and people are finding some of the curriculum right now extremely disturbing. Like, I think in school, I remember, you know, sex ed was something that we all had gone through, but it was down to, I think, a biological application on it which even you use that word now seems to be you know oddly polarizing but it was still at the consent of parents right. even at that time you had to make sure that if there was going to be that engagement uh, everybody was on board the curriculum was well known uh, and now there's a lot of that shifting into where um, parents aren't aware of what are being taught and it's not it's it's going into areas that is just um, some would describe unnatural, right? Uh, well, I, I would look at it this way. There's material that's being provided in schools that children are not allowed to take home. Mm. And you wonder, okay, why? And then I've seen some of the pictures of some of the material, and I can tell you, you wouldn't be able to put them on a, on a nightly broadcast on the news yeah, because they're adult content. What are we doing? Why are we having that kind of material in our in our in our schools? I mean, I thought you had to be an adult to have a good adult content. And so you you look at this and, you know, the other, um, uh, about a month ago, there was a case on, um, on Vancouver Island where there was a presentation that was done by a national group um, and they displayed a safe snorting kit hmm. with describing the various drugs, uh, how they can be consumed, the way they should be consumed, the various oh, wow, the yeah. various impacts, you know, the various highs you get from these drugs, how to snort them, how to switch from one nostril to the other, and how to make sure you keep things clean and high. Like, what? Yeah. We're teaching kids this in school? In, instead and, of geometry, and not, it's and not even, how to consume drugs. Yeah, and not even <laughs> one comment in the material that drugs are unsafe, that drugs are dangerous, yeah. that drugs can damage your life. Yeah. Not one. I'm like, this is what's being put forward. This is what's being brought into our school system. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. I just, I was shocked when I saw things like that. And I, and I thought, well, you know, has society really gone down that road? Or is there, you know, is this being pushed um, for different reasons? And I just, you know, like I say, I think, it's not, it's not in terms of going backwards, but I think we need to have a refocus of our education system to be able to move it forward for meeting what those needs are for today. Another one that's uh, important is the you were Minister of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation. And so now you've got a very good, uh, I think, understanding when it comes to a lot of uh, the nuance that that includes. <laughs> Uh, especially with, uh, I know you attended the Treaty 8 uh, meeting with the PRD. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Now, uh, we've we touched on land sharing, but there's, there's, there's a lot more that encompasses Aboriginal uh, con- reconciliation. W- w- we will start with the land sharing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? First of all, um, I'm really glad that you get you got the name right, Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, because lots of people get it wrong, and they mix it up with the federal government. And I think probably the most hilarious um, way I was introduced once uh, when I was minister was because uh, the federal government is Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, and provincial it's Abri- well, it was Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, now it's Indigenous. But the most funniest thing I ever got introduced was the minister responsible for Abor- Aboriginal Relationships and Affairs. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I was, you know, got to have a little bit of humor yeah. with these jobs from time to time. But um, um, there's no question there's, there's a big issue that's come up here, which um, apparently they they have done or implemented in part in, in Saskatchewan. And for the Treaty 8 Nation, when they signed the treaty, they were guaranteed their rights to be able to hunt and fish within their territory, you know, and carry on the traditional ways. And of course, a lot of the area up here has become farmland. There's been large tracts that are now private land. And so there was a, a, a conversation about uh, should Indigenous people have unlimited access to private land? Should they be able to wander on and go onto private land and, uh, 
uh, you know, carry on with their traditional ways of hunting, fishing, and, and you know, to other traditional uh, activities. So this is a this is a big question because what it goes down to is, is Section thirty five of the Constitution, and the Constitution uh, enshrines Aboriginal rights. And just Section thirty five, it didn't define what that is, but it enshrined it. But Aboriginal rights also includes what's called Aboriginal title. Aboriginal title is part of Aboriginal rights, and so the question, the real question, and, and the courts have not been able to address this at this point, is does Aboriginal title exist on Crown on private land? Wow, we know it can exist on Crown land. There was a court case, the Williams case, which is now called the Silkwatine case, yeah, that defined Aboriginal title on Crown land, but it intentionally excluded the private land, even though the private land was in the middle of that definition of of crown of aboriginal title so the real question would have been if you had a look at it would a judge have said um, if that private land had been included would aboriginal title had been found there and aboriginal title gives first nations the rights to the resources and and uh, basically be able to to uh, to do what they see fit with the with the land and so we've got this situation where if you start extending Aboriginal rights, Indigenous rights, to private land, does that then include title? Well, that, I mean, that's a really good question. Yeah. Do you know the answer to that? So I don't, because <laughs> the courts have not gone so through. So it's and a prelude it. for setting up the stage. Ultimately, this is a case that'll 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 wind through the court system and go to the Supreme Court of Canada at some point uh, because of this. And it's, I mean, it's coming. It's going to happen. And so the question then becomes. By recognizing that there is Aboriginal rights on private land, you're actually increasing the court argument that title should also be found on private land. And so it's a it's a very very important issue. It's not just about you know Indigenous people carrying oh. on hunting and, and and doing activities on on farmland or you know or on private land. It's the much bigger decision and discussion that needs to be had in terms of how this should be addressed. In addition to that, there was a very good question that came forward in the um, um, in the in the, the regional district meeting, which was: it's difficult to get insurance for property, for particularly for farms. How would that work with Indigenous people having free access? Could you even get insurance? How does that work in terms of in terms of uh, for for the agriculture sector? And no one's even looked at that no, question. No, no. And so that's a very important question for the immediate. Of, of activities within 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 farms, so this is a like I say, this is a very big question. There is uh, at least two court cases I'm aware of that um, uh, have been filed, and I'm not sure how they're progressing in the courts. That actually claim title on private land. One of them is in Haida Gwaii, and the other one is with the uh, Shikwepam uh, Nation, which is a, a group basically claiming everything from around Cornell down to down to Kamloops and over towards uh, the Alberta border, uh, including people's private land as Aboriginal title. So, I mean, I, I can't see the court saying we are going to turn private land over to First Nations, right? I can't see that happening. But what will eventually happen if title is determined to exist underneath private land, there will likely have to be some sort of negotiation and some sort of compensation provided to Indigenous people for the alienation of their title by private land. And you can imagine... What would that compensation look like for, let's say, downtown Vancouver? Well, I was going to say, I mean, there's private land, but then there's also industrial, there's civic. I mean, so what does private land encompass? Does that encompass... Any fee simple land. The province of BC and what it encompasses? Like, I mean, we're, we're, like, this could turn into... Well, exactly, right? So, so, I mean, I actually think, you know, reasonable, rational people, and Indigenous, non-Indigenous people... Um, can come to a conclusion on this, can come to a solution. It doesn't have to go into the courts and have this sort of draconian approach uh, that the court may have some finding one way or another. But this is where government needs to go. It actually needs to get its head out of the sand and address title, both mm -hmm. federal and provincial. Yeah. It needs to go down this route of having this conversation, doing a negotiation and resolving it so that there isn't this uncertainty so you don't have these friction points and you can actually get on with you know, permitting and carrying on with business and, yeah. and people can get on with their lives. Governments need to get their head out of the sand and address it. And things like UNDRIP and, and that path is not the path forward for doing that.
Well, it's um, it's not transparent by design. Uh, and wh- why, so if this is a provincial thing, why was the PRD, like what ki- what role was the PERD in this matter? Like, did they have any kind of um, plan or role? Because it sounds like a provincial thing instead of a regional thing. And it seems like there was a little bit of a, I Cart don't know. Before the horse? Yeah. So what do you make of that? I don't know. Um, of course, I'm you know I'm not part of the regional district. And I haven't wasn't there for the discussions that they had around it. What ended up happening is there was a proposal that had come forward. Um, Dale Bumstead moved this forward. I think he was working with uh, one or more of the uh, Treaty Eight Nations, and so he had brought this discussion forward for the regional district to consider. And then they put it on the table. They had a vote uh, to move this thing forward. Apparently, it was eleven in favor, one opposed. Uh, They've now since reversed that vote, of course, because there's a backlash uh, from the public. Uh, But Saskatchewan has started to go down this road as well, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on in Saskatchewan, but, I mean, this has huge ramifications for us as a province, Um, and, um, you know, really, as as Canadians, it has huge ramifications. Well, there's there's a few things uh, about that, too, that left questions. I mean, not only why was it through the PERD, but... uh, was this, with BC having sixty percent crown land and and a normal healthy it's actually about ninety five percent crown land. Is it is it ninety five? Yeah, it's even higher. Okay, well, I mean, even so, even better. I mean, most hunters like I'm a hunter, and and I'll go and I'll ask neighbors or you know people that might have private land for access, and that's a very healthy, normal uh, way of of going about it. So a lot of people you know, wonder what was this actually really about? I mean, if you want to hunt, that's not a problem. Yeah. It's uh, just, a, you, just ha- you go and have a conversation and, and many, many farm owners, uh, many private landowners, you know, indigenous people come and they have a conversation. They got a good relationship and there's no problem. It gets done. So it does make me wonder why this needs to be moved forward in terms of this, you know, this guaranteed or this, this right of access um, to well, private land. And then also, and makes, that's why I say it makes me wonder, you know, is this part of a, a furthering of a different agenda? Well, 100%, 100%. And I don't think it, we don't see representation uh, when it comes to Indigenous engaging. It's representation through B- Dale Bumstead. And so now you have more of a division between, you know, government um, and the public. That's bad, you know. Uh, this is going about it in a very wrong way. That's just being very destructive and deepening um, a lot of really negative results that we need to start. Which is fascinating when they're saying we need to bridge, uh, you know, build bridges and whatnot. But um, how does that so look like when you're only seeing one side of the story? It's the definition that needs to be thought of about about reconciliation. Yeah. The current NDP government's approach to reconciliation is government to government. So it is the provincial government to the First Nation government. Reconciliation is not about government to government. That's part of it. But reconciliation is about people. It's about neighbor to neighbor. It's about community to community. It's about, you know, industry and, and, and indigenous. It's about all of us, all of our activities. It's about how we find that path forward to recognize, you know, not just the wrongs that have been done, but strengthen, you know, what's happening with it and dealing, addressing what is in the constitution, but building that pathword forward, not at the expense of one or the other, but how you build it yeah. together for so that there is all, everyone benefits. That's not the path of this government. The current government is more about creating divisions, creating friction, and not just with indigenous and non-indigenous, it's in, in all aspects of what they're doing. They want divisions. They want divisive politics because then they can attack and label their opponents, hmm. and uh, and that's quite frankly is is leads to you know a very um, troubled society. One of the um, things that I kind of touching on that a little bit too is that you you had made a, a comment about uh, focusing on combating the uh, air quote uh, woke NDP and liberals uh, and providing more insight into like. I guess the question is, what would be your approach towards these parties? Because um, there need to be alliances in some areas where <clears throat> government has been known where different parties fight each other. Um, 
And I think there's a lot more strength with being able to align on common goals. So what does that look like? Like where would those common goals be? And what would your approach be to be able to focus on being able to actually attain some of those goals instead of it being, you know, opposition and government and this turning into where nobody really wins, nothing's accomplished. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's all in, in how you approach governing. Uh, but, you know, when I, when I think of the, my opponents right now, the NDP, the United Party, the Green Party, I really look at the, the NDP or the NDP, right? They're left to center um, in, their, in their policies and approaches. The United Party, I call NDP light. Or, or if you'd like, I call them woke and woke wannabe. And you can figure out which one is which. But ultimately, um, you know, I, that is where they are that in, on the political spectrum. And we're, we're not there. Right? We're more about, like I say, trying to do what's right for people, not about these ideologies. So if we're in a situation where we need to work together on issues, um, I can tell you, here, so here's my experience in terms of this. I actually, um, as, a, um, uh, as an MLA, I've chaired more committees than anybody, any other ex- ex- current MLA uh, in the legislature. One of the committees I chaired was a committee on natural resources and it was called the uh, midterm timber supply where i had the ndp and bc liberals uh, were working together on this there had never been in bc's history a unanimous uh, agreement or, or, or work on a resource uh, committee there'd never been agreement on that and and i actually had brought all the parties together and had a unanimous support and unanimous report come forward so i know how to work together and to get things done that's why when I was Indigenous or Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation Minister, I signed 435 agreements. Everything from creating the First Nations Health Authority to, to um, you know, forestry agreements to moving forward, LNG, um, pipelines, all these kinds of things. It's the art of how you bring people together and, and work. And so it just takes leadership, it takes experience, and you have to recognize that you aren't going to get everything you want uh, when you do that. But I asked that question because there's an interesting little story I'll tell you about. I don't know if you're fully aware of this, and and, but I'm going to show you something here because I, in the process of trying to become a little bit more um, learning and understanding of politics myself, I did a a, a podcast just like this with uh, North and South Peace MLA, so Dan Davies and Mike Burney. And after the podcast, they said, well, why don't you come down to Victoria? We'll give you a tour of the legislature and you can get a better understanding. And I said, well, okay, you know what, uh, I'm going to take you up on that. And and that's actually what I did. So I went down there and, I mean, I got to say, uh, it was a very neat experience. I mean, I, I was able to go to some lobby uh, events and I went into, you know, the question period. Um, I got a hell of a tour and got to meet some very interesting people. It was quite the experience. On that trip... I was able to go into, after question period, I went into the Douglas Fir Room, where you happen to be actually uh, asking questions to Minister Adrian Dix. I got a picture here I'm going to show you. Because while I was in there, this picture came up. This is what I took. So there's Adrian Dix. This is in Douglas Fir. There you are. We can zoom in, I guess, right there. Boom. Right there. I didn't get one with you standing up, but... Where I'm going with this is uh, I learned in this room that there have to be 10, 10 members. Uh, official opposition have to be able to create 10 members to be, I guess there's, this is one of two rooms that you can go into and start having these question and conversations that are just outside of question period that everybody sees televised. So with you being now... I guess, independent, more or less. In in this situation, you had to align with another party to have this opportunity. So you have that ability to be able to um, form, I think, common goals with other parties. And this particular conversation here was about you quizzing Adrian Dix about a lot of the COVID-19 policies information um i think particularly what you really did focus on this one was vaccine injuries in this particular one which i don't think a lot of people realize these questions are being raised uh, and i don't want to say behind closed doors but this wasn't something that a lot of people really see yeah so that speaks to what you're talking about as far as alliance um i guess the question would be 
how would you further that, I guess, alliance with um, other parties when now you're the leader of a conservative party that might actually be somewhat, if not very threatening, yeah. uh, you know, when you're when you're establishing and coming into power, <clears throat> power, achieving that goal. <laughs> well, politics, um, um, politics is the art of the possible, right? It's, it's the art of, of, of trying to make things work. And everybody has goals. Uh, and at the end of the day, I can tell you, so if I was to become the premier of the province, I mean, one of the first things you do is you meet with all your caucus members, you have to set up cabinet, you, you know, assign people to various duties, all that kind of stuff. The next thing I would do is I'd have a meeting with every MLA in the building from every party, you know, leaders, MLAs, et cetera. And the goal of that would be to ask them, what are your priorities for your riding? What are the things, what's, give me the top one, two, maybe three things that you would like to get achieved in your riding. Because at the end of the day, that's, people are elected to represent their riding. I don't care what political party they come from. And government's job should be to try to work with those people to try to achieve those goals. And sometimes they're unrealistic or sometimes, you know, you just can't achieve them. But that's how I think government should operate. It's not about one political party and how we've got power now we're going to do anything we want. No, that's not how government should be. Government needs to be a government for the people. And that means you have to work with representatives from all the parties to be able to talk to them about you know, what it is they want to achieve, how you can do that. Obviously, we're going to have political differences. We're going to be arguing. We're going to be throwing spitballs back and forth, you know, attacking one another, whatever it may be. That's fine. But let's set politics aside where we can and talk about the people because ultimately that's what we're elected to do to, is to try to represent them and improve their lives. So that would be one of the first things I would do and try to do that. And quite frankly, I would do that publicly. I wouldn't do it behind mm -hmm. closed doors. I'd make sure that uh, everybody was comfortable with it video it and put it out there you know they can use it talking to the to their constituents right it's all in should be in the public realm why should it be behind closed doors so you're trying to create more transparency within the government definitely that well, would I, allow i think the constituents to be represented in each riding irregardless of whether or not they fully align with your public or your your party's point of view on a lot of different things that's a that's a that's a tricky one to try and well, manage a, isn't it it's it's a i guess you could say it's a very different way of looking at politics but it's the way politics should be looked at yeah it represents democracy yeah hey, I mean, oddly enough that's and, weird <laughs> and, you know, and, and the other thing i think about quite frankly is we should actually use some direct democracy and i, I don't think direct democracy can be used for everything because typically the people only get engaged and involved if they're really passionate about an issue one way or another and it doesn't necessarily mean it represents you know what the broader public would be interested in but I believe strongly, quite frankly, that governments have just gone too far in terms of taxation. And I think mm -hmm. what, I, what I'd like to put in is I'd bring in legislation that would say uh, there will be no new taxes or tax increases except by referendum. You have to go to the people and ask them for more money if you want more money. And let the referendum results drive whether or not a government has the ability to raise taxes or not or to live within their own means. And of course, as a conservative party, uh, I would like to see taxes decrease, particularly you know getting rid of things like the carbon tax, and, and there's a few other issues that you know I'm looking forward to talking about when we get to the 2024 campaign. But uh, but I would put in legislation to force future governments, my government uh, plus future governments, to uh, have to go to a referendum to ask for the permission. And there'd be other thorny issues that would come up that I'm sure would, would come up over time that I would like to see done through direct democracy as opposed to just the government making a decision. We do have a representative democracy, right? The, the Westminster um, uh, model is a representative where you elect a representative to represent you. So that is the foundations of what we should be doing as a, as a government. But there are key issues that I think is very valuable to engage people on and to get their input, and direct democracy is a good way to be able to do that. Are you using that, especially when it comes to transparency, to be able to make sure the public is informed in a way that's going to allow you to manage it because it's going to be hard to be able to control inflation and economics while at the same time uh, maintaining, growing, uh, or even building infrastructure? Because like, that's almost like it's an impossible, that's an impossible feat. So, I mean, I'm just thinking like with what you were saying, what would the approach be without 
you know, no matter what you do or tur any turn you take, you're going to be attacked. And so the way to offset that is through better public awareness, understanding, and that's achieved through transparency. Well, I think, you know, in all decisions that need to be made, there needs to be transparency. And this is why I said, um, you know, at the beginning, what I want to see happen is to turn freedom of information completely on its head. Right now, this is, this is your information. This is the public's information. And you have to apply through freedom of information and pay a fee to try to get access to the public's information. This makes no sense to me at yeah, all. Yeah. I get when this was first talked about back in the early 90s, we didn't really have the internet. We didn't really have all of this you know, technology we have today. And so there was a process that went through. It was, it was timely. It was, it was really problematic. Today, we've got so much capability you know, with technology that we don't need to be doing the way things were done before. We could proactively disclose everything, everything that you know government does, and with the exception of you know there's issues of personnel, there's issues of budget, and things that that are are have to be kept confidential for you know for, for a variety of reasons. The freedom of information officer's job should be to define what cannot be released. Everything else would be proactively released, so there'd be no need for freedom of information anymore. People would have all of the information. They'd be able to see and a complete transparency of everything that's going on. So if they would like to look at it, if the media would like to look at it, that's fine. They can look at it. And then they can look at how government is responding. And they can judge that accordingly. Is government doing the right thing? Are they doing, you know, why, why are they doing something different? And let government explain their actions based on the facts, not operating in the shadows and, you know, putting stuff out there based on spin. Well, the... I hear that so sometimes right now where that information is public, you know, the we'll go back to Treaty 8 where this was apparently a very public uh, information everybody can look up, but nobody, we're, everyone, the general public was caught right off guard. And that's why I think you've seen such a reaction on the 11th hour, so to speak. So how would you manage that? Like when you're talking about transparency, um, and all of this information, which doesn't even really, I think, have a structure or ability for most people to be aware of, what would your approach be? Because to say, you know, this is what I want to do, and then the reality and the delivery of that, you know, it could be very difficult. So what would, what are your, like, what's in your, what's in, imaged in your head right now on how so, you achieve that? So the reality is this, about 85% of the people in the province don't care about politics. They don't look at it. They don't follow it. No. Some of them vote. Yeah. Some of them don't vote. Uh, about 15%, you know, take a look at at least some of it. And, and then a smaller portion of that look into details on it. And I, I get it, right? People have got to get by with their day-to-day -day life. They've got to, you know, they've got to put food on the table. You know, the ball game's on. They've got to look after their kids, whatever it may be, right? And that's just their day-to-day -day life that they're, they're doing with. They don't want to have to look at and deal with politics and deal with all this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why we elect representatives. It's their job, you know. We'll, mm. Look, let's get Mikey to do it. Yeah, Mikey will do it, right? I mean, that's sort of, you know, in simple terms, what, how our politics work. However, uh, when a decision is made or when a government is doing something that does impact on them, they want to know the details. They want to know how did this happen. They want to know, you know, why, why wasn't I informed? So it's important to make sure that the information, the full understanding is out there and available for people to look at when they want to. You can't be bombarding people on a day-to-day -day basis with stuff because they just go like, please, you know, enough. I've got too, many, too much else on my plate. But when there is an issue that is potentially contentious, when there is an issue that could potentially impact, you want to make sure the information is available and then you want to make some effort to make sure that, that you know, people know that this is coming so it's not done by surprise, so that you have the transparency. It's going to be important because we have some things coming down the pike like C11 and I believe 18 or 15, no 15, sorry, with, uh, so C11 now with, uh, internet censorship. And then now even with that, now social media and C15 where they have to, uh, pay media to be able to have that news on their news feed. Facebook is an example right now. Um, the transparency thing is going to be more increasingly important. The trust and the buy-in is another one. Uh, and, and before I let you reply to it, there, this is this is a bit of a finicky one that kind of speaks to the transparency because this is Im more important than most people, I think, realize when it comes to the freedom of speech and expression and everything else. But Trudeau, 
at the very beginning, I remember started talking about that when he was going against Harper. Transparency. Government needs more transparency. And look at now how he's flip-flopped with, like I just said, C11 and 15. And and last night, there was someone who raised a question that was a little bit more poignant about transparency. Um, and that's going to probably, you know, come up uh, more and more often uh, when people really have a lot of disdainment towards, I think, that term being used without any kind of follow-up action. So what do you, what is your response to a lot of that? Because it's probably going to be something where people, they, they pause and they question that. Yep. So it's a, you know, every government promises that we're going to be transparent and we're going to be responsible and we're going to, you know, and then when they get elected, all of that goes to the wayside. Yeah, exactly. And Thomas Sowell, um, who is a, uh, a brilliant man in the United States, he's now, I think he's in his 80s, but he came out and he once said, you know, the number one priority of a politician is to get elected. And the number two priority of a politician is to get reelected. Every other priority is way down the list. And so when governments get in, when political parties get in power, what's their goal? Well, their goal is to use information, because information is power, to use um, you know, spin to try to further that goal of getting elected or getting reelected. And so you might say, well, I'm a politician. Wait a second. You know, what, what do you say? Aren't you going to be wanting to do the same thing? And that's where, that's where we need differences. That's where we're, we're going to take a very different approach. I would much rather put all the information out there so that people can see it and judge for themselves and then judge, um, you know, a government or a politician based on their reaction to that information as opposed to, you know, just keeping that from the public and then having people having to judge about spin. I'll give you, I'll give you a prime example of this. So back when, we, back when I was part of the Liberal Party and we were in government, the NDP used to come out and just rail on saying, we have the worst child poverty rating in the country. It's just horrendous. How can we be so bad, at, you know, child poverty? This, the government just doesn't care about children. Well, that was true from a perspective of we were the worst child poverty in the country. But that was only half the story. And if people had the full stats, the full stats then they could judge what the politicians were saying you know, based on facts. Because the reality was child poverty rates had gone up by 38% in the 1980s, and they went up by 42% in the 1990s, and they had dropped 43%. They'd actually declined by 43% under the BC Liberals, but mm -hmm. it was still higher than the other provinces. Oh, wow. So both are true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so one side spins it one way, well, one context. side spins it, one Con side spins it the other way, yeah. but without having the underlying information you know, the public just looks at and says, well, they're both lying. And that's why there's very little trust in politics and in politicians. You need to put the, the actual information out there and then have government respond to what is really happening as opposed to keeping it from people and then just putting, trying to put spin on things. Documentation is important. And it even, and this is something I can relate to just even with work, because if you don't have a permit or if you don't have a, a, a piece of paper or documentation in one form or another, then it didn't typically happen. And so I think you're arming yourself with the ability of documenting a lot of things that are in a way to protect, I think, position. This is the information, the transparency now is the strength. The flip side though, I have to really ask about because you are giving all of this information out and it could be attacked in a way where you know it could be stigma um optics it could be you know extremists in one form or another if it doesn't fit a certain narrative or maybe a direction especially when you're talking about some really important uh subjects like aboriginal uh you know uh reconciliation we're talking about the school system talking about our health care we're talking about things that care people care very deeply about but are also able to be used as ways to be able to tarnish i think uh either a person or a party yep so people are going to use data they're going to use it whether it's out there in the public or not right uh, they're, they're going to use spin regardless oh this guy's bad because he likes pink dogs i don't know whatever you want to call it right yeah and so the only way you combat that is to have the real information out there. And if they're going to use real information to spin, that's fine. Let the public see it. Mm. 
But right now, what they're getting is just spin and half truths and misleading information. And you know, what is that really what we want as a society? No, not at all. No, that's a very unique, refreshing approach, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, it's different, but it, you know, and that's that's the advantage I have, right? I mean, I've been in politics a long time now. First elected in two thousand and five, so this is now my nineteenth year of uh, of being in politics. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot over those years, um, and I can take that experience about how to change politics so that you take away those those friction points, those tools that governments and polit- political parties use, and just make it transparent. It can be done, and it only takes one term. In one term, you can ch- make those changes, and I would dare any future government to try to reverse it. Why do you say that? You don't think there could be pushback from the public? If you came out and said, I'm going to eliminate your access to freedom to information, what do you think the public's reaction would be? I've been shocked at how they're able to manipulate a lot of other talking points in ways where um, yep. it's, it's... But this it's, is a fundamental It's almost core. like, it's amazing. I'm shocked. I mean, it's almost uh, a bit of an entertainment on how to see how that is achieved, really. <laughs> well, but, but part of it is the, the amount of apathy, right? 85% of the people you know, give or take, are not interested in politics. And so they can, they can trust that. You know, this is it's so much about politics that just, you know, sometimes really drives me crazy. And there was a, a time during an election, uh, I think it was a federal election, and, and uh, this was back quite a while ago now, and there was an absolutely horrendous story for the, the prime minister at the time. And this was during an election, and the prime minister was out doing a photo op event, and he was putting on skates, and he was skating with kids, and, you know, on and and it was you know a really nice family scene kind of thing, and the reporters were there just hammering him about this issue, and he was responding to it right, but this was going on in the background, and on the next day when they did their their nightly polling because that's what political parties do and you know large parties particularly in federally they kind of have this rolling poll about you know how they're doing how it did they actually saw the popularity increase and everybody went what's going on here this was absolutely horrendous how could this have gone up most people had the sound turned off of the television all they saw was the image of him out skating <laughs> with kids and it was a positive image right and so you wonder how things can get done well people if people aren't paying attention it really is not that difficult to to move to move things through and to make big changes, and it isn't until people go like, "Wait a second, how on earth did that happen?" Years later, that then people start getting fired up and riled up. And I talked to some people who lived, you know, under a communist regime, um, you know, back many years ago in Europe, and uh, and they said the changes didn't happen all at once; it was slow and gradual. Uh, attack and erosion of their freedoms uh, and the implementation of a, of, the, of a more authoritarian government. And it wasn't, it was only when they looked backwards that they realized how much they had lost, how much they'd given up. It, they didn't recognize it at the time. They didn't. And it's, uh, I've mentioned this, I think, in the past, but it still kind of holds true. And I want to bring it up again because, of all places, Netflix has a bit of a documentary series called. Um, how to be a dictator or a tyrant, how to be a tyrant, uh, which was interesting because the way they uh, outline this documentary, have you seen it before? No, I haven't. Oh man, it's, it's what they did is they took uh, historical figures that you look back on and you go, wow, these were very evil images. So of course, Hitler and Stalin and Kim Jong-un and all these different um, dictators in the past. And they said, okay, well, what was the playbook that all of them used and you look at every single one of them and it starts out with obviously usually it was economic strife of some form or another they were going to offer him hope it was all for the people uh and then they started you know offering different things where they were the the way and the answer out and it ended up with how history is depicting him now and i thought it was really interesting because there seems to be a little bit of a historical cycle that goes off you can use all the way back to the roman you know and i mean i'm sure even before that it's interesting to watch it because you get i think a little bit of a different perspective uh, and it does touch on obviously politics i mean these these were these were 
uh, well, some of them were world leaders, right? That that went into this cycle. Um, so I guess the the statement that was more of a statement, but it, it speaks to what you were talking about earlier, as far as you know, the government, the routine that we're in. And how do you break that cycle? And how do you get people to buy in? Because you're talking not only to the voters, but I think you're speaking to people who are wanting to get involved within your party too now. Yeah. Well, like I say, when you when you look at politics, when you look at these changes that are happening in our society, federal or provincial, um, and it's you know, while it's you know it's an erosion of some rights. Well, you know, people don't get too worked up about it. Some people do, and then some people don't. But then there's some erosion of some more rights. And, and erosion of more freedoms. And over time, if that pattern continues, mm -hmm. um, you leave the population very susceptible to much more draconian um, type of approaches. And that's, you know, you look at it, you know, for example, 15 minute cities, people talking, oh, you know, it's great when we have 15 minute cities. And you know, on surface, it sounds really good. You're talking about, you know, being able to live close to work, being able to walk and grocery shop, right? You don't have to drive around. You don't have to spend all that time transporting. You know, it, wouldn't that be great? And it is. It, it, it's a great idea. Except that, okay, so now I'm changing jobs and I'm no longer living within 15 minutes. What does that mean? That means I have to move. But I, my kids are in school. I want to stay here. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, you can't because you have to live within 15 minutes. So, or, or you can't switch jobs because... You know, so wait a second. Where does this eventually go? Exactly. In terms yeah. of in terms of these things, you know, and then you know the WEF came out, um, you know, the other week, and they're talking about wanting to reduce the number of, of vehicles in the world. They like to take out, you know, a billion vehicles in the world, two thirds of the vehicles. So does that mean that if I'm now working on the other side of town, I can't drive to work? And what happens if there isn't a bus? How do I get to work? It means I can't take that job. What goes on with this? And and so. All of these things are sound really good, but you have to look at it, you know, through the lens of what happens if, and that's where, that's where, you know, these, you, you know, I, I get very concerned about these types of initiatives because it, what it essentially does is it takes away your freedoms mm -hmm. and, and well, we give up those freedoms. You know what they say, cre uh, convenience is comfortable, comfortable is dependent. Yeah. And so who, what are you dependent on? And that's where 15 minute cities create convenience, dependency. Like, like I love the idea. I love the idea of a more distributed model of commerce and of industry, you know, so that you've got, um, you know, industry located in various places and, you know, so that, uh, so that you can be closer to where you're working. Commerce is in various places, doesn't have to necessarily be in a center. I love the idea of being able to do that. If, if the models work right and from a business perspective, I wouldn't want to try to enforce it. Because that does, they you know, look at, for example, um, people living in Port Moody. Um, if there was more industry and, and shopping close to them, they wouldn't necessarily have to travel into Vancouver or others, other communities. I think that would be great for a community like that, to be able to do that. But I don't think we should be like trying to legislate and say this is going to be a 15-minute city and here's all the rules. I don't think that's completely wrong. But if, you know, if, if there's a, a model that's going to be able to allow people to be closer to, uh, you know, have work opportunities closer to where they live and shopping opportunities closer to live, I, that's not a bad thing. But that should be a choice. It shouldn't be mandatory. Well, you mentioned the WEF, um, and that seems to be becoming more of a, a common public mainstream awareness when it comes to that. I mean, there has been public... Um, awareness about it with the whole, you know, reset and uh, everything that goes with it. Now, from your perspective on a provincial level that has been involved for quite some time, what are your thoughts and concerns and perspectives about that? That is, what are your thoughts on that? So I don't care what the WF thinks or wants to do. I don't care what any of the federal organizations or national organizations, well, international organizations, I should say, want to do. Uh, what I care about is people in British Columbia. And as a, as a government, we will be focused on the people in British Columbia doing what's right for them. And if that aligns with something that's going on internationally, that's fine. If it doesn't align, that's fine too. We need to put British Columbians first, and quite frankly in Canada, um, as part of that as well, in terms of our approaches. And that's why when I, when I talk about, you know, we want to reduce and eliminate the carbon tax, that is what it's about. It's about putting the people in the province first because it's doing nothing 
in terms of changing emissions. You know, we've had the carbon tax in place now since 2008 in this province. We have seen consumption of fossil fuels increase on a per capita basis at the same rate or maybe even faster than other provinces in the country. Yet we have the highest gas prices and gas you know, cranking up gas prices is supposed to reduce our use of carbon fuels. And that's, it hasn't happened. So what has it done? Well, it takes today over $3 billion out of the, t- the pocket of taxpayers. And it's going to take an additional $750 million on top of that every year until we get to 2030. So you look at that and you think, okay, that is the equivalent of doing a 60% tax increase, income tax increase in British Columbia to your personal income taxes from, from, from levels from today. 60%. And what's it going to achieve? It's not going to make anything, any difference in terms of the environment, but it will make a huge difference in terms of people's quality of life and how many people are struggling to put food on the table and how many people were driving into poverty. So you look at it and you think, if this is what the WEF or other organizations like the UN want to push for, I'm sorry, I'm not up for it. I am not up for policies that are going to intentionally hurt people and intentionally drive people into poverty. It makes no sense to be doing that. It's not the right approach. There are better ways to be able to address our changing climate. Yeah, well, it goes back to our original, at the beginning of the conversation about the retweet you made there about climate change. Um, what was it that uh, was so wildly different in that, I think, stance that you had from the Liberal, BC Liberal Party to what your position on climate change is? So many of the policies and approaches that, you know, the NDP and NDP light or woke and woke wannabe, whatever you want to call them, uh, want to do um, is... They want to be champions. They want to fight climate change. They want to be leaders in fighting climate change. And it's all virtue signaling. It's all, you know, about, you know, making you feel good about paying more in taxes because it's going to change the weather. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's about how they're trying to get votes. It's not about doing what's right for people. And that's, you know, that, that's, the, that's sort of the big shift. And so when, if you even question the narrative, oh my God, you know, you can't expose us as being, you know, frauds. You can't expose us as just being virtue signaling. I mean, you can't do that, right? This is this is where we need to be to get votes. Well, that's not where I want to be. But with climate change, uh, is shifting. How much of an impact do we have? Uh, how much are we compromising? You know, um, maybe industry, uh, self sustainability when it comes to energy. Um, renewable energies, whether it be solar, uh, you know, maybe wind. Site C is another one where, you know, to meet demand, uh, Site C is needed, but if you were to meet demand, Site C wouldn't be sufficient. I mean, these are very difficult so approaches let, when you're dealing with the climate change. Let, let's go Let's go into some basic numbers. <clears throat> and these, you know, lots of people like to turn out when they, turn off when they hear numbers, but this is an important. So British Columbia consumes as of you know, 2021, the last time I saw data on this from the Canadian Energy Regulator, British Columbia consumes 1,343 petajoules of energy. Don't worry about a petajoule, it's just a very large yeah. number. Yeah. Um, so only 16% of that, one six, is electricity. 84% is fossil fuels. Mm. And so if you wanted to replace, let's just say transportation, all transportation in British Columbia, so that's all your boats and your planes and your trains and all the vehicles that we drive, et cetera. That is 30% of our energy consumption. We would need to triple the amount of electricity we produce in this province to just replace transportation. That's the equivalent to building 20 Site C dams. Mm, wow. And so let's have a real conversation about what we need to do yeah. in terms of our energy security as a province, make sure we're not vulnerable in terms of, you know, our population, in terms of what they need, in terms of, you know, their quality of life. Let's have a real conversation about climate policy, not just a virtual signaling and setting targets. Because if people really saw, you know, what, what, what should be going on, we need to be able to go to people and, and say, okay, here is, here's the path. If we want to replace fossil fuels from transportation, we're going to need to dramatically increase electricity, it's going to take us 40 years, maybe 50 years, and a significant investment and, and build out every year going forward to generate that kind of power just to change transportation. Mm. And then let's have a realistic conversation about 
you know, batteries, where the cobalt comes from, what it, what the inputs are going to need to be. You know, we've got this target, for example, that we want to have by 2035, no more natural, or no more uh, gas-fired, uh, uh, gas-powered uh, engines. Uh, they all have to be, you know, the so-called uh, zero emission, even though they're not, because some of them hybrids they still use, which still use gas. But let's not let's not confuse, you know, their their virtue signaling here. How will that actually happen? When you look at it, the the number of vehicles in the world. Last year, I think there was a million vehicles or one and a half million vehicles or something like that, electric vehicles made. The world consumes, you know, 1.5 billion vehicles. A small, Mm. small fraction, 100 million vehicles are sold every year. A small fraction of that is electric. And every jurisdiction wants them. Germany, France, England, United States, Canada, China, Japan, they all want these electric vehicles. So how is it that, you know, we're going to take our 3 million vehicles in British Columbia and replace them with electric vehicles? First of all, I mean, there's all the infrastructure, there's the, there's the energy that needs to be created for, for powering them. But how do we even access them? Yeah. There isn't that many being produced. We don't have the cobalt being generated. We don't have the copper. We don't have the, the minerals we need to actually build that many vehicles, let alone if we can get our lion's share of what's being produced for other countries. But we still set these targets. They're unrealistic. It's all about virtue signaling. It's all about trying to get votes. It doesn't put people at the center of policy. It sounds good. And it's not only just the attainability, but there's a a maintenance and an end result. What do you do with all these batteries? Where is the recycling and the disposal and the whole process of the end result of it all? Um, You know, there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. Exactly that. You know, in Norway, um, where they've got a pretty extensive uh, ferry network, at least two of the of the private ferry providers, and these are large ferries like we use in British Columbia, they have banned electric vehicles from being on those on those ferries because if there's ever a fire, there's nothing they can do about it. Mm. Not only the toxins that are put out into they the air. They banned? They They've banned them. They're not allowed to go on those ferries with an electric vehicle because, <laughs> really? because of the risk of, of, a, of a fire. Wow, geez. There and you so, go. Yeah, let's, let's start talking about the reality of what, these virtue signaling are trying to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, this all, you know, unicorns and butterflies, right? There is some real hard statistics and real hard information that needs to be thought about in terms of this transition. I've wondered it too, because I found a little bit uh, surprising that anytime you have an alternative form of energy and they do build it out and they, you know, put contingencies in there, whether it be wind and, you know, the reliability of it all, when you have something get to a point of where it's built out, whether it be Site C or whether it be windmills or solar or these alternate forms of uh, energy, every time it gets built out to a point of sustainability, it's attacked. Site C is an example of that. You know, you have hydro energy. Well, really not very popular for a lot of different people. You want to clear it, stewards of the land and I guess uh, the impact when it comes to um you know, natural gas and that, that form of energy. But the alternative is, you like you're saying, with the batteries, it's either open pit mining. Uh, solar takes a tremendous amount of uh, a footprint. Um, same with windmills and any kind of alternative. Uh, I know there was uh, nuclear uh, power plants that they were wanting to use for electricity and, and, you know, that was shot down. So anytime an alternative seems to get built out, um, it's not feasible, and then at the same time, they're trying to phase off of, you know, natural gas. And I, it doesn't. This is this is the reality that people need to have the information on. So, what is the true cost of wind and solar? Yeah. What yeah. is the true cost of firming that power? Because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun isn't always there, so you need to be able to firm that power. And batteries are not an option to store it. So that means you've got to build out more capacity than what you have, and you have to build out backup, or you're going to have brownouts. You're going to have periods of time where you don't have electricity, like we've seen in other countries and other jurisdictions. So let's you got to have a realistic conversation. And then what are the costs and what are the impacts? When you look at wind, wind isn't perfect. There's all kinds of environmental impacts from using wind power, not to mention no one knows how to recycle the wind blades. 
and they're only good for you know 15 years or so and then they start degrading and you're lucky to get 20 to 25 years out of them solar panels you're lucky to get 12 years and then they degrade pretty significantly you know if you get 15 to 20 years out of them and then you have to replace them what's the cost of that replacement not about just building it once it's about what you do for the next century for power and for energy and the sources we need to have an honest conversation about what our energy mix looks like and how we can be energy self-sufficient as a province. Well, not only that, but I mean, we're talking about uh, environment. That's the whole purpose of climate and the reason for doing this. So being stewards of the land, what's the impact that all these alternatives have on the land compared to what our current option is? Like? Exactly. And more importantly, you know, our population is growing. Our demand for electricity is growing. Our demand for energy is going to continue to grow. How are we going to meet tomorrow's fix? Mm-hmm. And, and just not even transitioning to, you know, say using more and more electricity, eliminating, for example, natural gas out of homes. Okay, that's that's interesting. Our grid can't handle it, right? Our power production can't handle it. So we have to significantly imp- increase power production if we're going to do that. That's something we can do. But what does that mean for our electricity charges? What does that mean for people's quality of life and affordability? Do they have to start choosing between hydro and food Mm -hmm. because they can't afford electricity because the rates have gone up so much because we've moved away from a high density energy source like natural gas? So we need to have these conversations. It can't just be about setting targets and pumping up our chest and saying, boy, aren't we doing good things? Let's have a realistic conversation about where we want to be and give people choices. This is the options we have in front of us. What do you think about energy and uh, trying to take that to market? I got to, we can, I know we're getting, well, maybe a couple more questions and then we can wrap this up. But I do want to kind of hit on that because we're talking about, it kind of fits with what we were just talking about with energy. Um, What is your position now when it comes to being able to get uh, energy to global markets? And not just the U.S., we're talking global. If we want to improve our healthcare system, if we want to improve our education system, if we want to make sure you know, we reduce taxes and make life more affordable for the people in British Columbia, we need revenue seams. And you can't do it through you know, taxing the rich. You can't do it through taxing corporations. All you do is you end up driving that revenue out of the province. It actually is negative and not positive. We need new revenue streams. And what we need, quite frankly, is we need to be able to export our, our natural gas. We have it in abundance. It is a a beautiful transition fuel for people. Uh, But more importantly, there's a billion people in the world today that don't have electricity. We get to come in, we get up in the morning, we turn on a light switch, we look at our electric clock, we plug in our, our, you know, our, our, our uh, kettle and, and boil water for tea or coffee. We go into our refrigerator. We just take energy for granted. A billion people in the world don't have electricity. They want electricity. They want to improve quality of life. And so China's building two coal-fired power plants every week. India's building coal-fired power plants. You know, Africa needs to build out uh, power and infrastructure. They need to build out coal plants. Do we really want them using coal? Or can we help them to be able to use something different? And that's where our natural gas can be in huge supply. And we can't do it by using e-drive. We have to do it using natural gas compression. And I think we should be focused on on, on expanding uh, our LNG exports and expanding that industry because we need the revenue. We need to offset so many of our other costs to, to, to improve our quality of life for the people in British Columbia. And it's, it's what is readily available for us. It is a nice, easy thing for us to be able to do. And that needs to be a focus of a future government. That's good to know. I, 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 man, I love hearing that. What about... Um this we'll start wrapping it up after this but uh immigration because that speaks to i think uh workforce uh, a lot of different levels but and it kind of goes into immigration so what are your thoughts on that um boy we managed to cover off everything here in 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 one show trying to trying to hammer it out there (laughs) but it, it, it speaks to the fact that there are so many issues that really need to be addressed. And it can't just be about virtue signaling. You need to actually have honest conversations, which is what I try to do with everybody. Immigration is a a very important issue. Um, We have a labor shortage. It's plain and simple. We don't have, you know, talk to the school district about how how they struggle to get teachers up here in the north. Uh, The other day I went to get a a chai latte from the Starbucks here in Fort St. John. They can't get staff. It took an hour and a half, or it took 45 minutes, I should say, to get through the line to get a coffee. I mean, it's, it's, 
crazy. There was a, a company that uh, had a big project. They bid on a big project. They needed 150 dump truck drivers. They could only get 50 mm. because there isn't the drivers. Yeah. You know, we don't have the doctors. We don't have the nurses. You know, we don't have the other professionals we need. Blue collar, white collar, it doesn't matter. We need, we are short on labor. Um, my In my community of Vanderhoof, I think it's somewhere between 125 and 165 jobs are going open because we, they don't have people to fill those jobs. And so the only way we can solve that is to bring in more people from other jurisdictions. What we need to do though is we need to make sure that when they're brought in, they're brought in with the skill sets we need, that they can plug in in terms of the work, that we support them in terms of, of getting in and getting part of that so that we can fill these needs that we've got as a society. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to level off in, in terms of that balance between our workforce and our people that are retiring so that we, uh, so that we have that, have what we need as a society. But in the short term, we need to deal with that. But of course, a big part of that is going to be housing. You're bringing yeah. in <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of people into this province, into a province that already has a housing crisis that doesn't have enough housing. So we need to be able to significantly ramp up how much housing we're building as part of that so that you know you don't drive up the unaffordability issue for people. Well, there seems to be a little bit of an exodus with the baby boomer shift kind of going out that I think concerns have been voiced in the past that you might have availability. And so here, here's an interesting number. <clears throat> and every government has used this number. You know, over the next decade, we're going to have a million job openings in British Columbia, a million job openings. And why? Because people retiring, you know, natural slow growth, whatever process it would be, you're going to have that many jobs available. But we're going to graduate, you know, probably 600,000 kids if we're lucky. And maybe not all of those will stay in British Columbia. That means we are short four to 500,000 people every decade. Wow. 50,000 people every year that we need to put into our economy to meet those needs. Wow, this is a big number, isn't it? And, and it's, or is it just, know, sound, just, it's just sound it, big? Like that it, sounds it, like. It is. It's a big number. <laughs> it is a very big number. And it, and it sounds daunting, but that's the type of thing that you need to look at if you weren't prepared to govern in this province. How do we address those basic issues? So that, you know, we can make sure that we provide the best quality of life we can for people and that, you know, have a government that's going to stand up and actually fight for people. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We should wrap it up. because One thing I'm going to actually mention, though, that I don't think this is something I became a little more aware of. And I hope the viewer understands what uh, the value in some of these longer conversations bring is the fact that your schedule and everybody's life is so hectic. And so to be able to capture an interview or a conversation with like with yourself especially in a way where there's this kind of openness and this conversation back and forth with an answer that's, uh, you know, a little bit more poignant and meaningful is rare. And I hope uh, people find the interview uh, valuable, but also I want to make sure that um, I'm recognizing and appreciating your time for sitting down for this length of time, because it's not every day you get to have an opportunity to talk for this length of time and cover like what you said there, all these different subjects uh, it's a tough one to do, and I think we need more of it out there. Well, you know, most people consume uh, news or interviews and stuff in 10 or 20 second sound bites. And if they're lucky, maybe they'll go a couple of minutes, right, in terms of their, their engagement with this stuff. And so, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's important to be able to condense and get that information out there because everybody's got busy days, everybody's got, you know, the things they want to do. But it is nice to be able to go in depth from time to time. And, and yeah. so thank you for that. It, my uh, my pleasure. And just know that these long form conversations, I don't know how people consume them. I have no idea. <laughs> but well, it's I, out there. I, and Joe I, Rogan's the biggest out I, there. I, and he's I doing four to, hour interviews all the time. I, I, I was listening to Tucker Carlson on on the drive up here. And, and oh, what yeah. I did is I, you know, I, I put it on. I couldn't watch it, of course, because I was driving. But I, I put it on my phone and put it yeah. through to my to my uh, speakers in my car, right? And, and just drove listening to the interview. And so it was, you know, for the long interviews, there is ways to do that when you have those blocks of time that you've, you know, are forced whether you're driving or something like that. But yeah. it is hard for people to find this much time to be able to uh, to sit and listen to an interview like this. So, Tucker Carlson, I got to ask you: Do you know where to find Kevin and scripted in, uh, uh, content? I don't. Can I tell you? Please do. Oh, are you guys listening? <laughs> KevinUnscripted.com. <laughs> okay, that's good. The website. I I'm I 
go to that don't go to, i'm on youtube and everything else i prefer the website though because youtube and all these other options are awesome believe me but they're wildly inaccurate when it comes to analytics and all these other hurdles you got to go through whereas if you go to the website that Kevin i have scripted.com oh you just nailed it Kevin on that's, that's right good. I'll, I'll, it's I'll all there to... everything you need just go there i like it that's good awesome okay well thanks again and uh hopefully we'll chat at you soon and we'll take care Wave to the audience. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thanks <laughs> okay. for the conversation. My pleasure.